okay we are going live okay we are live done okay so i will now start yes just a sec So welcome all of you to this uh, webinar on practical insights of delivering high quality care for expectant mothers and their new nets in the covid-19 era i am dr vikram datta president nationwide quality of care network and i welcome you to this collaborative webinar which is a joint effort of lady harding medical college new delhi and oxford university hospitals nhs trust united kingdom and nationwide quality of care network i welcome a very distinguished uh, pool of uh, faculty for this uh, webinar today and i have the pleasure of uh, inviting the faculty and uh, on my uh, my first speaker today on this webinar who's going to be interacting with you is a person of great eminence dr amit gupta dr amit gupta is a clinical director of newborn services at oxford university hospital nhs trust oxford and he is the clinical lead in icu john radcliffe hospital oxford uk we have very eminent uh, professor nn mathur additional director general of health services ministry of health and family welfare government of india and currently the director of lady harding medical college and associated hospitals new delhi also with us we have professor vb bangal professor in head department of obstetrics and gynae rural medical college pravara institute of medical sciences loni maharashtra state a national mentoring group mentor for ministry of health and family welfare nationwide quality of care network india we are pleased to welcome dr anupa khanna vich consultant obstetrics and gynae himachal pradesh telemedicine tiramal swast india and a nmg member with nqc in india we welcome dr sushil shrivastav secretary nqc in india and currently working as associate professor and in charge of the neonatal icu at university college of medical sciences and dtb hospital new delhi and finally we have the star of the show show dr ankur sudan who is a quality improvement consultant and he is going to apprise us about the quality improvement methodologies which we can use to our advantage in this covid era Ankur is a WHO CRO consultant and advisor with NQC in India. Well, I would uh, also like to introduce the moderators. Uh, we have Professor Harish Kumar Pemde, advisor NQC in India, director professor at Lady Harding Medical College, and secretary of the Ethics Committee, Lady Harding Medical College, as one of the moderators. And you've just been hearing to me. My name is Vikram Datta, and I'm the president of Nationwide Quality of Care Network. i work as a director professor of neonatology at lady harding medical college and i would be moderating this webinar along with my friend dr harish pemde the schedule which we have planned uh, for uh, the today's session is to make it interactive and very engrossing for all of you we are trying to finish this webinar in approximately 90 minutes from now the first presentation would consist of ppe covid 19 perspective from the united kingdom being taken by dr amit gupta this will be followed by the administrators perspectives challenges and learnings by professor nn mathur clinical perspectives by dr anupa khanna and professor vp vp bangal on obstetrics and labor and delivery aspects and perspectives from neonatal icu in india by dr sushil shrivastav and lastly like i mentioned applying quality improvement thinking in times of covid 19 by dr ankur sudan this will be followed by interactive question and answer session for all of our friends who are joining on the youtube live stream of the show i would request you to please post your questions in real time in the chat box and the nqcn team is going to pass on those questions to the moderators which will be addressed please don't forget to write your name and the place from which you are uh, uh, asking this question and then followed by your question into the chat box and we will be having a short question and answer session following this webinar and that is how we are going to conclude 
So with this, I'm going to be stopping uh, sharing my screen now, and I am going to be requesting. Uh, I'm going to be requesting uh, Dr. Amit Gupta for the first presentation. So, Dr. Amit Gupta, uh, can you please start your presentation, please? You can share your screen, sir. Okay, can I, uh, Vikram? Thank you very much uh, for for having me. I'm going to just share my screen, um, and if you have to tell me whether it's uh, can you see? Yeah, we screen? can see. You can put it on full screen, Amit. Okay, I can put it Excellent. on full screen. Yeah. As in, uh, I can start the presentation here. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Absolutely fine. Yeah. So, um, uh, as a matter of introduction, thank you for having me here, and I'm going to uh, focus on PPE only, and uh, in respect of the use of PPE in the neonatal unit. That's where my focus is. So just to give you a background, uh, the UK is um, now coming out of the crisis because we have passed the peak. But at the peak time, we had a situation in Oxford where we had um, quite a strong preparation for uh, an onslaught of cases. The number of deaths in the UK at the moment are about 600 to 700 per day. That's significant. But those deaths are slowly coming down. So over the past five to six weeks, what we have seen is um, a lot of change in guidelines into what PPE is appropriate. Um, we have gone from a perspective of using a lot of PPE to moderating the use of PPE in the neonatal unit. And so we've gone through this journey of uh, confusion and changing of, of guidelines as the disease progressed. So that is part of the learning that we've had. Now, to make it very simple and focused, because I've just got about 10 minutes, um, what I want to make it clear, what is the PPE I'm referring to? There are two types of PPE, PPE1 and PPE2, as you can see. PPE1 is simply surgical mask, aprons, and gloves. That's very simple. And the PPE2 is the more, uh, is the more uh, comprehensive one, which has got the N95 masks, gown, gloves, and with eye protection. I keep saying hand washing is the key, but that's what we reinforce at every every um, uh, every training session. Uh, it's also important that the N95 mask that we use is one with the ventilated ports, because we found that using the one which has got no ventilated ports very difficult for staff to use, and because it's almost like you know it's it's like suffocating. So we have just got the ones which has got two ventilated ports, and that's what our definitions, right? Um, the key principles that we, we apply, number one, there is no evidence so far, or at least no conclusive evidence of transplacental spread. So when you have a newborn, even if the mother is COVID positive, you are expecting the newborn to be negative. There's also a small tidal volume in babies. And so therefore the risk of aerosol spread, even in an infected baby is very limited, the tidal volumes being small. Generally, COVID-19 babies do well, um, do, do well generally, and uh, they clinically do well. None of them are uh, uh, being ventilated in the UK. And also the worldwide, uh, uh, worldwide uh, experience has been that ventilation in preterm babies and in term babies has been very minimal. In fact, the reference that I've attached is a New England Journal of Medicine article and uh, they have looked at about close to a thousand children and none of them have been ventilated. The signs and symptoms that we see are very unlike at the adult syndrome. And the main thing to remember on the neonatal unit is that the risk on the neonatal unit is from adults. And I can't emphasize that enough. It's not from babies. And I think that's very important for staff to get. It's the adults in the unit, which are the, are, are the risk uh, they are the ones who are uh, at risk of spreading and receiving, but the babies themselves are very low risk. Um, in generally, uh, neonatal staff and parents use simple surgical masks. Only one parent is allowed to visit. We do not move a baby into isolation if, if, if the baby is suspected of, uh, of having COVID positive, only if the baby turns out to be positive. Now we have a separate isolation area for COVID positive babies, but in practice, we have never had to use it. And 
one of the problems that we've had in having that isolation area is the staffing, you know, getting enough number of nurses to staff it. So in practice, what has happened is we've looked after the babies in the same area as the rest of the unit unit. Again, hand washing is, is being reinforced. And one of the things that I want to emphasize that the disease, apart from the disease, the biggest problem that we face is staff anxiety. It's our junior doctors, it is the nurses who have got a lot of anxiety around it. And that's something that every unit unit has to manage. Right, I've got uh, what do we use, uh, what PP do we use at different scenarios? So at birth, um, we know that when we do COVID positive surveillance, that is every mother walking into the unit um, and being surveyed, on labor ward, it's about 20%. And that's reflective of the amount of spread that is there in Oxford. In New York, it's between 10 and 20%. In some of the hospitals in the US, it's close to 30%, right? So what we've got is a very simple plan, irrespective of the COVID status of the mother, whether you know it, whether you don't know it, whether you want, you're waiting for it, whether the mother is positive, either of those, irrespective of that, all the staff that we send, they use PPE1, which means gloves, simple apron, and a face mask. If you're intubating a baby, then you pop eye protection, which is, which is either the visor or the, the eyeglasses. This applies to all instrumental deliveries and, lumbar and LSCS, as long as there is no GA used. Because if there is a section under GA, then we use the PPE2. The, the rationale is that if you're using GA, then the mother is getting intubated and the adult getting intubated is very high risk. And therefore, we, we all don the PPE2. Um, but if, if there is no GA, then resuscitation happens in the same room as the mother. All we make sure is that it is about at least two to three meters apart, as in the, you're not very close to the mother. All our midwives, irrespective of the COVID positive status, are in PPE1. So even if the mother is positive, the midwives and the, and the doctors who deliver mothers are in PPE1. If you are on the neonatal unit and you've got a baby, when do you suspect uh, COVID positivity? That's a big question. Um, there is no usual definition which will apply for newborns. Uh, we started screening or looking for, for uh, COVID positivity where there was an unusual course. You know, there was a contact suspected, either the mum was COVID positive or a nurse was COVID positive or suspected of COVID positivity or the baby's clinical course was, was uh, unusual. Now, we looked at our data one month in a region which is Oxford and Southampton, which is 60,000 births a year. We tested 72 babies with suspicion of COVID based on clinical criteria and contact criteria. Nine of them were positive. And these are most of these babies who were positive were not positive uh, after, as in uh, they were not admitted to the new unit, unit from delivery suite. These babies were spent time with mother on the postnatal ward, become unwell, and then they were admitted to the unit. All the babies remained well. None of them required extra ventilatory support. And, and therefore that's increased our confidence. And what's happened is the amount of tests we are sending for babies with suspicion of COVID is falling very rapidly. So we, when we were very anxious, we were sending tests all the time. Now that number of tests is falling. So that's what we do when we suspect COVID positivity. So apart from that, if you've got a normal infant, you, our philosophy is normal care for normal babies. So babies in the rest of the unit are brought out of incubators for skin to skin irrespective of respiratory support. So it doesn't matter whether the baby is in high flow, it doesn't matter whether the baby is on a ventilator or on, on CPAP, it's fine. Babies can be brought out. If you have a baby who is clinically suspected or has got proven COVID positivity on the skin, on, on the sample, you transfer the baby always to a closed incubator. I say that because it may be relevant in the Indian context. Whereas here, all babies are in closed incubators. You use PPE1 for routine care of the baby. 
But if you lift the lid of the incubator, then you should have PPE too, especially if you are on CPAP, high flow, or on the ventilator. So these are aerosol generating, and therefore, when the lift, when the lid of the ventilator, uh, sorry, the lid of the incubator is lifted, you've got to be extra prudent. But you do not need PPE two, which is the big PPE, if you are doing a procedure from the porthole of the incubator. So that's how we manage the babies on on the neonatal unit. If you've got a baby with suspected or proven COVID who suddenly collapses, then what you've got to do is if you're not ready with PPE2 or anything, you, the first operator has to start life support, making sure there is some eye protection and give airway support, but don't intubate. And you have to wait for the rest of the team. Somebody puts on PPE2 and then start intubating. Yeah. So this guideline has come from adult medicine to pediatrics. So we haven't changed it. In fact, you could argue that the risk from the baby is so little that PP1 should be fine, but we've retained this, that if you've got a collapse, the attender starts the resuscitation with PP1, doesn't intubate, but wait for the PP, wait for somebody else to come in with PP2 for intubation. And I've just got the last two slides. This is simply for sharing. I'm not going to explain these two slides. I'm just telling you, that if you are in, in a delivery suite, we've got these posters put up in delivery suite. And, and this is, we put these posters up in rest of the wards and how to resuscitate them. Um, and and that's, that's all. The only other thing which I wanted to add was in, um, it's not a benign disorder. Although we, we are quite low, we are managing PP in that way. 92% of all deaths amongst doctors in the UK are from black and ethnic minor minority Asians. Um, and we think it could be a higher risk factor because of our underlying tendency to have hypertension, diabetes, and so on. But in the UK, they're doing an inquiry. So with that, I'll end my, this, uh, my presentation. Um, and I think I have kept, hopefully, to time. Uh, thank you so much, Amit, for that excellent presentation. And we will uh, request you to kindly stay back despite the extremely busy schedule in your unit. No, no, it's uh, fine. The question and answer session. Vikram, shall I switch off my uh, I'm, PowerPoint? I'm, I'm just stopping your uh, sharing, yeah. Amit. I'll put Professor Marco's screen now. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Amit. Right. Yeah, so I'll be sharing Professor Marco's uh, presentation now. So I uh, hope uh, I'm unmuting Professor Mathur, sir. Uh, uh, I hope everybody can see Professor Mathur's screen. Uh, Sushil, can you see Professor Mathur's screen? No, sir. We I don't see it right now. Okay, just a sec. I'll just just give me a moment. Yeah. Yes, it has okay. been. So we, uh, yeah, Professor Mathur, sir, welcome. And uh, the uh, yes, thank sir. you, Vikram. Professor Mathur, you can start, sir. Thank you, Vikram, and uh, for inviting me to this uh, webinar. And I um, will uh, just uh, like to share some of my uh, experiences and uh, which I faced uh, in last three months. Uh, after just becoming a director, immediately the first challenge that I faced in my uh, tenure as a director was uh, to manage this COVID problem. And um, we didn't have any separate block or a hospital to manage COVID patients. So fortunately, this is uh, uh, our hospital, as you know, is a hundred years old hospital. The uh, main building is hundred years old. Uh, though we have some structures like Kalavati Saran with the new building, but um, the large hospital is uh, quite old. So we had fortunately built recently uh, almost constructed oncology block, but uh, it could not be used uh, straight away. It had to 
uh, some permissions had to be seek and then we made a facility in our uh, oncology block which is a three storied plus ground floor uh, structure in which uh, we have we could make uh, on a war footing a uh, new hospital for uh, covid patients which has uh, icu as well as indoor uh, facility uh, isolation beds and it has the capacity of 40 patients there we also had to construct a new uh, BSL guideline uh, lab for the RT-PCR and uh, which we did uh, on in a separate uh, portion of our microbiology department and um, uh, it had to be also done quite fast in the month of March, mid um, early March. And then, uh, but our hospital is uh, not running just like a COVID hospital. It has got both the COVID as well as non-COVID facility running. And when the hospital is both COVID and non-COVID, the challenges are more uh, because uh, uh, the work pressure is tremendous and you, your staff, uh, there is a challenge that which staff to put in COVID facility, which staff in non-COVID facility. You can't change the staff from COVID to non-COVID again and again. So the separate staff for the COVID, separate staff for the non-COVID and then their roster. So it's a challenge. Uh, the PPEs, as Dr. Gupta just told, they have quite a uh, easy classification of PPE one and PPE two, which we do not have, and we have uh, various levels of uh, PPEs. And our um, the 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 main PPEs uh, born in the COVID ward is um, uh, is some uh, is the uh, their level two or maybe um, still higher. Uh, level of PPE, uh, uh, but uh, getting the PPEs in India to start with was a challenge because it was not made here. Uh, so we had to import, uh, but uh, slowly and now we are quite comfortable in our stock of PPEs. Uh, the challenge is which PPE to wear, wear, uh, 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 wear. The challenge is not much in COVID area. There we know the enemy and uh, so it's easy. Challenge is in the orange zone where there is a suspect area. Unfortunately, what has happened is our hospital is just next to a containment zone, uh, rather many containment zones, four of them, and there are hotspots there. So uh, uh, any patient coming by definition to this hospital is a suspect. So there is a lot of challenge, you know, in because the reports uh, RT-PCR reports take time to come. Uh, so um, uh, if you give it in the morning, then they will come at night and uh, so on. So uh, by the time either the cesarean has already taken place or the surgery has happened or the delivery has taken place. So uh, most of our challenges was how to protect our healthcare worker uh, who is working in the suspect area. And uh, if you wear the PPEs all throughout the days in the suspect area, it's not very comfortable. And uh, uh, you have your blood pressure is very, very high. It's just like a new uh, normal hospital running in the PPE, which is not a very comfortable um, sort of a um, attire to be in. And uh, you know, uh, it, it's not possible to work for long hours in uh, complete PPE. So uh, how to, um, how to make a roster so that some staff is there in, in, in a waiting area and only the minimal staff goes inside the orange area and does this work intensively and then comes out and then the, the waiting staff then goes and then the next waiting staff goes. So that way we have made a roster and that, that making that roster in that way is quite a challenge. Uh, then there were issues about accommodation for the healthcare workers. Do they can they go home? Can they go to the hostel? Can they go back home or uh, to, um, uh, and there were challenges in that. So uh, should they be provided the hotels? And the hotel, because of the lockdown, the hotels were not very easily available around, uh, but slowly we made arrangements and uh, we have uh, many rooms now next, uh, just next to our hospital in Connaught Place um, in, in the hotels. Uh, but the biggest challenge Right now, what I'm facing is the morale of uh, the workforce. 
uh, unfortunately, as the uh, we are one and a half months into intensive COVID uh, um, uh, work, and we have found um, that some of our healthcare workers have got exposed, and uh, especially the problem is with the interns. Uh, some of the interns have got exposed, and uh, there the challenge is there that how to uh, maintain the morale. So uh, every day in the morning, I have uh, for last one and a half months. I had been having the meetings of uh, all the head of departments and the nurses and uh, representative of the resident doctors. And uh, this has happened all throughout. Uh, it is, uh, and it has helped us quite a lot. Um, I get a lot of energy from them and they probably get some energy from me also. Uh, we are together, we resolve the issues, we discuss the issues in, right in the morning and uh, maintaining the social distance and uh, in a large hall. And um, uh, it, this is uh, ever growing uh, uh, all throughout the period we have, we had been together. It's just like coming together at one point in time, not too much near, but, uh, you know, helping each other, hand holding each other uh, at that time. And then I have instructed every head of department to hold similar meetings in their respective departments. Then the challenge was training and the retraining. This training and the retraining uh, had been a constant exercise, innumerable seminars and symposiums and uh, um, uh, donning and doffing and uh, guidelines and uh, all, all uh, material related to uh, the COVID had to be, uh, every, each and every staff had to be trained um, and the training had to be different for the different staff, the doctor different, the nurse, nurses different, the health, the, the, you know, the clean, cleaners different. So um, uh, it was uh, all, all uh, uh, different uh, things. Um, uh, the guidelines had been changing uh, all throughout the, um, uh, the time. So the guidelines have, and the main challenge is sending the information in real time and the instructions. So we have made the use of, you know, the social media, it's WhatsApp, our, um, Twitter or whatever, um, and the WhatsApp has come very handy in sending all the information, all the circulars, and uh, which goes to each and every um, worker of the of the organization, uh, whether he's a doctor, nurse, or the lab technician, or safai kamchari on the WhatsApp, and uh, that has worked very well in in, in this time. Uh, and then there had been lockdown challenges. Uh, the doctors cannot come from the nearing states. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, Delhi is a red zone and uh, the uh, adjoining Haryana is the orange zone. So there is a big problem crossing the border. So uh, th those challenging is, just challenges are there. So these were the challenges and the issues that we had faced as an administrator. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, the, the challenges there in UK and other countries will be just some, some of them may be similar, but some of them would be very different. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mathur, sir. I think it was enlightening to hear the administrator's uh, perspective. And um, uh, I think uh, most of the participants, sir, we have nearly 250 participants who are watching you live right now on YouTube and many more who would be sent this recording. I think it's a tremendous uh, uh, perspective for them to hear the administrator's perspective because normally we get the clinician's perspective. Previously, we've done a nursing perspective also. But hearing the per administrator's perspective and the challenges gives the teams greater morale and they become more empathetic to mutual uh, needs and requirements of such a crisis. So thank you so much, sir. We we'll request you to stay on. And if there's any emergency, we will be very happy to have you back, sir. Uh, I now uh, would request uh, Dr. Anupa to kindly start sharing her screen and start the next presentation. Thank you, Professor Mathur. Sir, so are you being able to see my screen? Yeah, absolutely, ma'am. Please go ahead. Um, to begin with, uh, this is an unprecedented global war, and the entire mankind, in fact, is facing the same enemy, the novel coronavirus. While other things I think can be held in abeyance at this point in time, but pregnancy and deliveries can't. 
and the need of the hour for us is to reorganize and restructure ourselves to face this pandemic. Today, during the course of my presentation, I would be covering antenatal care during COVID, effects of COVID-19 infection on the mother, on the fetus, how we can leverage technology to deliver this high quality care, telemedicine as the way forward. And of course, there is a story from the field. I will try to stick to my time limit. As we all know that the first case of COVID was reported in the city of Wuhan on 12th of December, which is a port city and also famous for its seafood. And it happened to be from the seafood market. Till after uh, three months on 11th of March, it was declared as a pandemic to the state where we are in now, that is a state of complete lockdown. Right at the outset, I would like to echo what WHO says, that all women have the right to a safe and positive childcare childbirth experience, whether or not they have a confirmed COVID-19 infection. We all know prevention is better than cure and the preventive measures which are applicable to any woman who is pregnant are much similar to any other adult that is social distancing to uh, emphasize on uh, hand hygiene, regular disinfection of uh, surfaces, etc. But the two things that I would bring to everyone's attention here are Especially after the birth, we now have to look into uh, the ways how we can minimize visitors who come and visit the mom and the baby. And also a social custom in India, which is to celebrate the seven month milestone of a pregnant woman, now would need to have a different way to celebrate this. Because I think even if we are over the pandemic phase, COVID is here for some time to stay. So we will have to probably rethink our ways of celebration. What are the ways in which we can do prevention are very same, but I would still take this opportunity to reiterate them that staying at home, hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, avoiding touching the face and keeping safe distance are of prime importance. Brings us to the effects of COVID-19 infection on the mother. As whatever small study on a small cohort of patients who have been pregnant and have the COVID-19 infection have been studied, it has been found that the course of the disease is not very different from what the course is in any other adult patient. That means majority of the patients will pass on with flu-like symptoms and recover fully, unless and until they also have other comorbid conditions associated, something like hypertension or diabetes, etc. No vertical transmission has been reported from mother uh, to the neonate after the neonates have been tested immediately after birth of COVID-19 positive patients. And some amount of study has also been done on other viruses of the same family. And what has been reported is that the vertical transmission through the placenta is negligible. So the effects on the newborn, as I said, there is no transmission. So as of now, COVID-19 infection is not an indication for a medical termination of pregnancy. Now this brings us to a very important area, that is about how we innovate and change our protocols in the time of COVID infection about uh, around antenatal care, which we are giving to our patients. Here I'm referring to all normal patients who are carrying in the COVID times. So what happens is that uh, how we can innovate is that we can probably shorten the duration of each antenatal visit. Maybe we can give a performer and take negative positive history well beforehand or use telemedicine services for patients to plan their appointments well ahead of time. We could send them a performer via an email or a questionnaire uh, on the telephone so that the waiting period in the consulting is also not very uh, high. Secondly, if the patient is being uh, accompanied by a family member, we make sure that it is the minimum number or maybe just one person accompanying the patient. And we can also reduce or increase the interval between two, uh, two antenatal visits. If the patient is in a normal, uh, lying in the normal, uh, uh, normal range, in the sense a patient is uh, having no complications, then maybe uh, four visits at 12, 20, 28, and 36 weeks would suffice. However, I would like to mention that if the patient falls in the high risk category, then we take her during, uh, during her antenatal care as what we would do in non COVID times. The antenatal care for COVID suspect patients remain the same with uh, reiteration of hygiene advices at every visit. 
and there is a query which keeps coming up from patients as to the dietary advice, whether non-veg is safe or not. So the WHO has come out with uh, an advisory which says that if it is cooked well, it can be consumed. Coming to antenatal care for patients who are pregnant and are COVID suspected. Here we would need to uh, probably delay uh, patients who are having symptoms. We can delay their antenatal visits till the, subs uh, till the symptoms subside. And any time during uh, the period, if the recurrence of uh, symptoms occurs in these patients, they should be retested for COVID-19. Then uh, patients who are uh, self-quarantined, maybe because another family member has been tested uh, positive for COVID, their appointments, if there are no complications, can be deferred for a period of 14 days till the quarantine uh, duration is over. Whenever a patient needs to visit a healthcare facility for whatever mm -hmm. uh, reason, preferable to take their own transport or call 108 and inform about their status, not only to their medical team, but also to the, the people who are arranging the uh, ambulance services. And any woman who has had a delay in appointment in our Indian settings as of now may be a little difficult, but I think it is a thing we need to think around and come up uh, with solutions for it that any patient who misses her uh, antenatal visits for more than three weeks should be contacted. And uh, finally, coming to an antenatal ultrasound, uh, if, uh, an ultrasound is required for the fetal surveillance, then it can be postponed till 14 days later when the resolution of the disease has, or the symptoms have uh, subsided or the patient has not turned to be a COVID positive patient. To sum it up, the ANC services, how they have changed is that now we need to provide telephone numbers to our patients for contacting us, whether for a routine appointment or whether they are coming in, in emergency so that the team is appropriately uh, prepared and they should be informed about the triage, special triage areas which are there in hospital facilities. We should be widely using telemedicine services, screening and asking for history suggestive of COVID infection at every point of contact and not to forget psychological support is very, very important because it is a time when lots of pregnant women are uh, undergoing uh, anxiety. A little mention about PPE, which has come only yesterday from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for all OPD patients where we are seeing normal antenatal patients in a routine OPD in a, uh, in a consulting chamber. The protection level is one because there is only mild risk. So that would be only a triple layer uh, surgical mask and latex uh, gloves. This brings me to the second half of my presentation, which is around telemedicine practice guidelines. These guidelines came out in March, and uh, in fact, the COVID has uh, played as a transformational officer, and what was lying as a draft with the ministry, now in collaboration with Niti Ayo, has, um, uh, has, uh, has been taken out, and with this, telemedicine practice in India becomes legal. A very important milestone, a huge topic, but today the aim of this uh, presentation is going to be to familiarize ourselves with a little bit of uh, telemedicine and how we can uh, start using it as a supplementary uh, service which we can give our patients. The traditional uh, role of telemedicine we all know has been to deliver the last mile of healthcare in um, our country to make sure that Specialist care is available to patients in rural in, uh, India and to probably save them uh, from the out-of-pocket expenses. But the emergent role of telemedicine now has been that it has been used as a frontline tool. It has been a game changer. Primarily why? Because not only from a patient's point of view that uh, a patient need not uh, travel to a facility and can be contacted at home, uh, counseling can be done, advice can be given, and uh, monitoring can be done remotely, but also helps the risk of exposure for, uh, for doctors and for the, for the healthcare staff, which is very essential, especially when we know that our health system resources have been stretched out. That brings us to a very important question that who can do telemedicine? So after the guidelines have come out, it says that any any doctor who is registered with the Indian Medical Council Act 1956 is eligible to do uh, telemedicine in current times. 
only until there is a course which is supposed to be uh, coming out and once uh, it is out all practitioners will need to undergo this course before they can practice telemedicine uh, as a way forward also uh, during the time of any epidemic pandemic or any disaster like what we are facing now if we have an extra cover of these two uh, these two acts and um, if any more detail is required regarding them then i would request everyone to undergo section 4 and section 73 of these acts to get, gather more information regarding these types of telemedicine uh, contrary to our belief that uh, telemedicine would need a advanced sophisticated uh, uh, software hardware it needs to be a uh, um, connected to a electronic health record uh, it is not so because i feel that uh, what we are going to currently be using as a tool is maybe our own maybe our uh, smartphone a simple thing like a, a smartphone and the way we can use it is uh, is very dynamic it can be used for sending a message uh, by the patient to fix an appointment it can be used uh, to send an email to a patient to uh, fill a consent form before uh, starting with a tele consultation if we need a video consultation to see a lesion for example a rash we can use either a video call or we can use a, a image which can be shared via a, a smartphone so we can innovate and we don't generally stick to one platform but we use a hybrid platform uh what i use uh, in my practice is uh, a model which is where a healthcare worker reports to me with signs symptoms and helps me with the examination of the patient but what we would routinely use in our opd in current times would be a consultation model which is between a patient and a regular and a doctor here i am going to highlight certain important uh, do's of telemedicine at any point in time telemed in telemedicine Uh, it is very important to know the identif uh, identity not only of the patient but also of the doctor both of them have to identify themselves it cannot be an anonymous uh, consultation a registration number has to be displayed at every point on, uh, in contact proper record keeping the way we would keep it for our routine patients is important but here the records are going to be different they are going to be in the form of images they are going to be in the form of call logs it may seem a little cumbersome but finally at the end of the day it is for our own protection so i feel it is worth going through that uh, little inconvenience the prescription has to be in a proper format which is authorized by uh, the pharmacy council of india which we routinely uh, give and it has to be scanned and sent to a patient for the records of the patient as well as our records the do's of telemedicine the important ones are that no personal data can be disclosed without the consent from a patient even if we are sharing some images the identity of the patient cannot be revealed and in case of telemedicine uh, and in case of emergency uh, there is a limitation but we cannot deny uh, a consultation and we can give a consultation in the form of uh, first aid or a referral advice what needs to be done so this is the different ways in which we can take a consent before prescription i have already said that it, we have to send a copy of the prescription to the patient for him to avail uh, the drugs which are required and also for the sake of record keeping we have been using technology and uh, in uh, other forms as well in the form of helplines they have been a great great support system during the time of covid not only through the incoming calls from patients where the patients have queries anxiety the mental issues are being dealt with but also now they are being used to make outbound calls to patients or people who are in quarantine to check on them to check on their symptoms and the progress of disease and also the patients who are suggestive of covid infection to help them triage them to nearest facilities so it brings me to last but one slide of my presentation where uh, this is a story from the field as to how my consultation type has changed from the pre covid time to the post covid time routinely my consultation is of gynae and antenatal uh, patients and i see very little antenatal patients and if at all they are all in the 
the normal patients who are uh, coming to uh, for me uh, coming to me for a tele consultation which can be seen on the uh, graph on the left side which are highlighted by the yellow uh, which is there whereas in post covid after uh, after the lockdown uh, the scenario has changed so there are a lot of high risk patients who are falling in the category of routine normal anc they are staying at home the number of antenatal visits are being cut down but few of the high risk patients for example a hypertensive a controlled hypertensive uh, hypertensive who is on anti hypertensive medication is coming to my opd to get her bp checked to see the weight monitoring fetal growth and all of that and now what we can see is that in the post covid era instead of going to hospitals these patients are coming in and we can advise and look after them via tele uh, tele consultations this is something we are learning every day about and there are new advisories which are coming up every day so it is it is advisable that we stick for the latest updates to the website of the ministry of health and family welfare and for the international updates the who official website the link is given below the carry home messages are very few and that is that we don't need to be anxious we have to allay anxiety of all our patients because they need to follow the same recommendations as any other person during the times of covid to prevent covid the course of the disease is same in pregnant patients uh, unless of course there are comorbidities associated and it is the time to leverage technology and form new protocols for antenatal care i would end by quoting the director general of who he says and i quote we never we have never before seen a pandemic sparked by a corona virus this is the first time a pandemic has been caused by a corona virus therefore we have never before seen or controlled a pandemic before so the person is you and the time is now to adopt and adapt to new technology to be able to overcome this pandemic thank you thank you so much uh, dr anupa uh, for that excellent presentation and that perspective on telemedicine i think it will be quite unique for most of our uh, teams which are attending uh, remotely and i think the myth got busted today that telemedicine means uh, very high quality you know studio like setup with a good call center like executive sitting and leveraging technology and you shared an example from himanshar pradesh and also how even high risk mothers are now approaching you for uh, telemedicine facilities and you very successfully managing them and i think professor mathur earlier in his presentation has shared the lady harding example which is a unique example in a public academic hospital which is the first to start telemedicine across all departments is going on very successfully in lady harding medical college new delhi india so thank you so much uh, with this uh, dr anupa i now have the pleasure of inviting uh, professor vb bangal professor bangal is going to uh, talk about the practical aspects of managing uh, women who is suspect or positive covid and who attend attends the delivery room or the obstetric emergency and how to take care of such uh, women uh, in uh, the best evidence based possible manner so professor bangal the uh, floor is all yours sir you can start sharing your screen sir Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. At the outset, I thank NQCN and Dr. Vikramatta for inviting me as speaker in today's prestigious webinar. My topic is clinical perspectives on management of labor and delivery, with a special emphasis on keeping healthcare teams safe. the objectives of my session are clinic to understand about the clinical presentation of covid positive case i will be speaking on triaging in obstetric unit labor and delivery management and c section protocols most important being bio safety measures for healthcare workers then a bit on protocols for postpartum care and some of the miscellaneous issues that have come up in this covid era why address this issue it has been highlighted by previous speakers 
that there is a lot of apprehension, anxiety, fear factor when we are dealing with COVID or suspected COVID cases. Maybe it's due to inadequate evidence or knowledge. We all know that things are changing daily and new information is coming up. Thus, there is a challenge to healthcare system to maintain the quality of care and ensure safety of our healthcare team with whatever available resources. We all know that labor and delivery is a time of anxiety and stress for patients and healthcare workers. Why? Because it requires longer and frequent close contact between patient, doctor, and nurse. Thus, there is more possibility of contracting a disease. Thus, how do we know that the patient is a suspect or has a COVID-19? The symptoms could be new onset of fever or chills, cough, and shortness of breath. But we should also keep in mind there could be some symptoms like sore throat, muscle aches, rhinorrhea, nasal congestion. Some patients may have GIT symptoms like diarrhea, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and maybe headache. Sometimes it has also been seen that there are certain abnormalities like smell and or test could be there in a COVID case. We should always keep in mind in obstetric practice that whenever patients are coming with severe low respiratory tract infection without any clear cause, we should always suspect COVID. If the patient, this particular case is coming or residing or have traveled to a location where there is community transmission going on or has had close contact with a confirmed or suspected COVID case in last 14 days, always suspect COVID and act accordingly. According to the disease severity, the disease has been classified as asymptomatic, which says that the test is positive, but still there are no symptoms or could be mild illness, moderate illness, severe illness, or could be a critical illness wherein there could be respiratory failure and all other multiple organ dysfunctions. We all know that there are certain serious complications related to COVID-19 and it ultimately affects kidney, liver, and heart. In heart, there have been reported cases of cardiomyopathy, pericarditis, arrhythmias, and sudden cardiac deaths. So how do we deal with this situation? In an ideal case scenario, there should be pre-hospital notification by a case or a suspect case from community, from home, wherein a woman should call in advance to alert the maternity unit about her arrival whenever possible, whenever she has some symptoms. This gives us a time for our healthcare team to prepare a triage and done the PPE. Ideally, they should travel in a private transport and they should be received at the hospital entrance by a healthcare worker who has done a PPE at reception. At the hospital entrance or a casualty or a fever clinic, what they are calling today, we must record the temperature. And if it is having a temperature, our protocol is different. We must ask about fever, shortness of breath, and all those symptoms which I have already said. And accordingly, we should decide whether the patient falls into category of COVID, non-COVID, or others. There is a WHO concept of clinical triage. What is this? It's a system for assessing patients at admission for COVID-19 followed by immediate isolation of suspected patients in a separate area away from other patients. Thus, we can control the source. In order to have this clinical triage, there has to be a high level of clinical suspicion. And this should be through healthcare workers. We should find out these cases, whether they are COVID or non-COVID or suspect COVID. We should have a well-equipped trial station at the entrance of the facility with trained staff. And there could be a screening questionnaire so that it helps us in identifying COVID and non-COVID. At the reception or in triaging, negative pressure room is prepared and which does not have any unnecessary items. Restriction on entry of non-essential staff is there and we can allow a companion, a single companion along with the patient and 
we must ask the history, which I already said, whether the patient has come from any hotspot area or has an immunocompromised condition or comorbid conditions. There's a big role of a team leader in an obstetric unit because the person has to organize a team, plan duties, training of the staff has to be carried out. As it's already been said, there's a lot of apprehension and people are running away or going away or trying to avoid getting involved into this isolation wards or suspect uh, taking care of these suspect cases. We need to increase their moral and train them so that whatever that apprehension is there that is reduced or removed. A person who is in charge must not panic herself or himself, should keep cool, calm and composed rather than ensure preparedness of health, human resources and other resources. In this era where we were not really using all those things like disposables and consumables or medicines like hand sanitizers, disposables like cap, mask, it's a duty of the obstetric unit team leader to see that everything is available at appropriate place in appropriate quantity. We must maintain a communication with team and relatives should be vigilant about implementation of biosafety measures. Even today we observe that in a, even after repeatedly being telling, being told that use these minimum barrier precautions, the health staff is not taking that barrier precautions. The students, residents, nursing staff, we find them not sticking to the whatever rules have been made. So it is the duty of the team leader that to ensure that biosafety measures are properly taken. Ensure availability of COVID response teams. We all know that if the patient is critical, we need help of all other team members like medicine, physician, anesthesiologist, critical care consultant. So hospital, it's actually a hospital's duty to arrange all these teams and obstetric unit must ensure that all these people are available. When we are talking about the caring of these suspect or COVID cases, we also need to look into the emotional needs of our healthcare workers, which has already been mentioned by previous speakers. They are also under constant stress and they are also worrying about their own health and constant anxiety of passing infection to their families when they go home. Extreme levels of stress, depressive disorders and anxiety and insomnia have also been re recorded. That's why it is very important that we increase their moral while they are on duty. When we are dealing with these cases, there are certain standard precautions which must be taken in the ward, hand and respiratory hygiene, appropriate use of PPE according to the risk assessment, safe biomedical waste management, proper cleaning of linens and environmental hygiene, sterilization of patient care equipments. Coming to hand hygiene, the use of alcohol-based hand sanitizers before and after all patient contacts, whether it's antenatal, intranatal, postnatal, whatever, whenever we contact these cases, we must use hand sanitizer. Whenever we are coming in contact with potentially infectious material, we must use hand sanitizer. Before putting, putting or upon removal of PPE, including gloves, we must use sanitizers. It can also be performed by washing with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. That is another alternative if the sanitizers are not available in adequate quantity. If hands are visibly soiled, it is suggested that first we use soap and water before returning to alcohol-based hand sanitizers so that whatever is visibly soiled, things are there, they will get washed off. Personal protection equipment. <coughs> we are talking about the respiratory protection, eye protection and body protection. For respiratory protection, there are certain alternatives depending upon the level of care which we are providing. It could be triple layer surgical mask, N95 face masks. It is required when we are performing an aerosol generating procedures or in areas where neonates are on CPAP or on ventilator. For eye protection, we must use goggles or face shield and for body protection, either there are long sleeved water resistant complete gowns or single piece head to toe water resistant body cover, which is ideal for attending resuscitation 
in delivery room or in ot in suspect or positive cases hand protection goes always and the gloves must be well fitting little more about the mask management we need to see that the mask is properly used now what all things we should be careful about place the mask carefully ensure it covers the mouth and nose and tight securely to minimize any gaps between the face and the mask avoid touching the mask often there may be some irritation to the skin but we should avoid it because it is risky remove the mask using an appropriate technique carefully untie and pull away from the face without touching the front after removal or whenever a used mask is inadvertently touched clean hands using alcohol based hand rub or soap and water replace mask as soon as they become damp do not reuse single use mask discard single use mask immediately upon removal so these are little more information about the mask management and many times it is being ignored use of n95 mask or respirators there is something like putting on the respirator how it should be used and this is depicted in this picture also we there is a something called checking your seal and the details of this you can go on the net and find out but there is very important thing that the mask has to be properly put on and removed as well as we must seal we must check for the seal whether it is proper or not otherwise it is it becomes useless use of n95 respirator it should be it is shown in this that how it should be put and how it should be removed discard the respirator when it becomes more difficult to breathe through it if it becomes dirty or moist the respirator is damaged do not touch in front of the respirator it may be contaminated these are the government of india guidelines regarding what type of ppe should be used and if you see that in triage area in opd this green marks or tick marks are shown only in the triage area registration counter temperature recording system but for icu facility critical care ward where aerosol generating procedures are done and sari ward or maybe sample collection area in the laboratory or maybe dead body packing there all the n95 mask gloves gown cover all goggles head cover and shoe cover are being used or must be used in mortuary also it is advocated that all those tick mark areas those should be used now yesterday only we got a recent guideline regarding ppe types and its indications in patient department in a non covid hospital or non covid treatment areas i tried to find took only the areas in the labor room and operation theater these are considered as moderate risk areas and recommended ppe for labor room is triple layer medical mask face shield sterile latex gloves and n95 mask patients to be masked in the labor room may be surgical mask can be given to them if the woman pregnant woman is resident of containment zone in operation theater performing surgery or administrative general anesthesia again it is considered as moderate risk we are talking about the non covid hospital recommended pp is triple layer medical mask face shield sterile latex gloves and goggles and of course already ot staff shall be wearing the regular ot dress so these are the pp types and indications for use in non covid hospitals this is one picture from my hospital where my residents and the faculty are using these are the basic requirements for use in the non covid hospital in order to avoid contracting the disease in from through asymptomatic cases now certain general guidelines for intrapartum management as i have said patient should wear clean hospital dress and a surgical mask for admission till discharge minimum medical and surgical interventions during course of labor 
use of partograph for monitoring and cardiotocography for assessment, reduce in and out movement of labor room staff. We must equip labor room with adequate stock of medicines and consumables, hand sanitizers, surgical mask caps and liquid soaps, maintain hand hygiene and clean working environment, disinfect of all, disinfection of all medical electronic gadgets after each use. Remember, as Anupa has already said, all women have the right to a safe and positive childbirth experience, whether or not they have a confirmed COVID infection. So respectful maternity care continues to be there even in the COVID era. We respect and dignity, provide dignity to our patients, allow them to mobilize and adopt a birth position of their choice. Pain relief is their right. A companion of choice is also their right there could be slight modification in our policy and there should be clear communication by staff with the patient and the relatives. So this is how respectful maternity care continues in this COVID era. Regarding delivery room, we must keep multi-speciality teams ready. For COVID cases, separate delivery room and operation theater with neonatal resuscitation corner located at least two meters away from the delivery table. Standards and facilities required for infection control should be same as for suspected or confirmed COVID cases. Intrapartum assessment and monitoring. We must give a little more importance on COVID symptoms during labor or during delivery. And maternal observation, including temperature, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation with the help of pulse ox will help us in finding out whether there is any deterioration in their condition. It is said that oxygen saturation should always remain above 94 or 95%. If it is dropping, it's an alarming sign and we should take help of the physician or maybe a critical care consultant. Labor management in COVID, it's same like our routine management, normal course of labor is expected or is allowed. We use standard obstetric practice and guidelines Every examination and contact, there has to be adequate protective wear, use electronic fetal monitoring. Second stage of labor can be cut short if mother has a maternal exhaustion or if she has a parenchymal lung disease by forceps or ventures, whatever is applicable and correct for that particular case. Periodic evaluation of the respiratory status, as I already said, watch on their symptoms and oxygen saturation. If there is any deterioration, intensive care measures, including ventilation may be required. Coming to labor analgesia and anesthesia, as pain relief is her right, epidural analgesia becomes the best option for her. If patient is being taken for C-section, epidural analgesia can be converted to epidural anesthesia. And if there is a respiratory compromise, general anesthesia can be instituted and subsequent ventilation will be needed. Regarding caesarean section, till date, the literature says that all women with COVID positive status are being operated by C-section. There is no proven scientific rational for this. It could reflect local preference and practices, but caesarean section for obstetric indications. And if there is a respiratory embarrassment is the WHO protocol. And it says that whether C-section for suspected or confirmed COVID-19 case, yes or no, no. WHO advice is that C-section should only be performed when medically justified or indicated. The mode of birth should be individualized and based on women's preferences alongside obstetric indications. We all know that these women also suffer from psychological disturbances. There is a lot of anxiety, postpartum depression is known and mental health issues are also known. They need counseling, psychological support, and few cases may require psychiatrist consultation following delivery. Coming to cleaning, disinfection, and maintenance of labor room and operation theater area. For surface cleaning, it is said that alcohol and chlorine-based liquids are useful, 70% isopropyl alcohol, or could be 1% sodium hypochloride solution can be used for cleaning and disinfecting the surfaces. Contact time advocated is around 30 minutes. Biomedical waste disposal, wipe floors, walls and object 
surfaces two to three times a day with 1% sodium hypochlorite. After a procedure, biological fluid, blood, and fecal matter should be treated with above solution before disposal. Biomedical waste disposal update says that we should use separate color-coded bins, use of double-layered bags, mandatory labeling as it's a COVID-19 waste, maintain separate record of COVID-19 waste, and 1% sodium hypochlorite solution should be used for disinfecting bins and trolleys. General waste without contamination is disposed as per the solid waste management rule 2016. There are certain miscellaneous issues. Birthing position, although we prefer supine or modified lithotomy, as I said, if the patient chooses or insists on certain birthing position, it's a right and it should be allowed to have birthing in her position of her choice. Birthing balls, which are being used at some places, they are better avoided because there could be fomites on these birthing balls and possibility of infection. Underwater delivery is better avoided. Umbilical cord blood banking can be allowed. We may think of reducing post-delivery or post-operative hospital stay in low-risk cases. Sometimes the patients are critical whether we should continue pregnancy in those cases or we should terminate or induce labors. If the patient has pregnancy beyond 32 or 34 weeks, some have advocated delivery if the patient is stable, but this could exacerbate the mater maternal condition. Between viability and 32 weeks, it is better to continue maternal support with fetal monitoring, which is uh, suggested for perinatal benefit as long as maternal situation remains stable or improving. Induction of labor, a condition where there is a COVID-19 case with pneumonia, but not intubated. Consideration of delivery in pregnancies more than 32 or 34 weeks. Rational behind this is, in these cases, there could be deterioration in her pulmonary condition and patient may have maternal hypoxia, so we can induce the labor. Prior to 32 weeks, no induction of labor is done because the babies are too premature and otherwise also chances of survival are less. The take home message from my talk is we should isolate COVID cases or suspect COVID cases during labor, delivery and C-section. They should be separate provision of operation theater. Designate minimum required staff, train them, supervise them, support them in management of COVID. Adopt universal biosafety precautions for non-COVID cases. Practice routine management of labor and delivery. Use of partographs and electronic fetal monitor for assessing the progress of labor. Use appropriate PPE during labor, delivery, and C-section. Caesarean sections under general anesthesia, regional anesthesia for obstetric indications and only select serious cases with poor pulmonary function. Follow principles of biomedical waste management and psychological support for patients and healthcare workers. So these are my references, mainly the FOXI, GCPR, ICMR guidelines, Government of India guidelines. Then we have guidelines from ACOG, RCOG and WHO as far as infection prevention and control practices are concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bangal, sir, for that excellent and detailed presentation. I think uh, you have clarified many doubts today, including my own personal uh, doubts which we were having in day to day because the guidelines are very rapidly evolving. And uh, I think this was requested, and, and this was one of the main, uh, you know, aims of doing this webinar was to address uh, the delivery teams in the labor room, and that is uh, per se the most important aspect because. Uh, Mother and neonatal diet is something which is very important for maintaining the continuity of care and for the SRMNCHA, I would say, and Harish is here who's part of the adolescent WHO collaborating center. So uh, the government is looking at, uh, you know, reinitiating high quality services and that was one of the aspects which you covered beautifully. Thank you so much, sir. So with this, we very quickly uh, move on to uh, Dr. Sushil Shirvasta for giving his uh, perspective on uh, neonatal ICU experiences from Guru Tej Bahadur Hospital, which is one of the large uh, hospitals which is actively taking care of COVID patients in East Delhi. And uh, Sushil is the NICU in charge, like I already told you. Sushil, please go ahead. The screen is all yours.
Is it visible? Yeah, My... it's absolutely fine. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vikram. Uh, just a correction. Ours is not a COVID hospital. Uh, we are dealing with uh, predominantly non-COVID patients. However, the challenges are uh, uh, quite because we are in the uh, red zone of uh, containment areas also, and we do get cases of suspect or positive COVID cases. Having said that, I, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Bangal, Dr. Anupa, and Dr. Amit for uh, making my work much easier. And I'll be just discussing the important salient points. Now, we all have seen in earlier presentations that no viruses have been detected in breast milk or amniotic fluid. So the transplacental or perinatal transmission of the virus is extremely rare, and the baby is not expected to be infectious at birth. This is very, very important, because if we understand that, then our approach becomes much more rational. So transmission is mainly by a via droplet spread from close contacts or inadequate hand washing. And that's what we should emphasize while receiving babies in suspect or COVID positive patients. Now, the other important part is that babies, uh, unnecessary admission of babies where it's not indicated should be avoided in present um, pandemic era. Uh, and the guidelines which I am discussing or we are following would be mainly from ICMR, MOHFW guidelines, and some of the recommendations have been taken from your uh, NNF and FOXI uh, clinical practice guidelines. Now, temporary separation has been defined and is preferred uh, where a risk uh, or benefit uh, analysis must be done contextually. That means till the mother gets tested of whether she's COVID positive or COVID negative, uh, temporary separation of the newborn may be uh, uh, better both for the uh, parents as well as for the management issue. However, if the mother expresses her desire, then the risk and benefit and the facility availability, it can be decided contextually. So rooming in or co-location is, if it is unavoidable, where uh, you have a paucity of facility uh, space, you have um, a large number of patients, or uh, the parents explicitly express their opinion that we are comfortable considering that there is hardly any transmission um, uh, if precautions are taken. So with universal precautions, rooming in or co-location is also recommended in your ICMR or MHF guidelines. If mother is unwell and the baby is ready for discharge, then the baby should be discharged home with a parent or a carer as early as possible within 24 to 48 hours. Now this policy we are following, and again, it is being recommended both by your ICMR as well as by your uh, clinical practice guidelines from uh, NNF and FOXI. Now uh, for COVID-19 infection, there should not be any change in usual delivery protocol as we have all seen. The PPE part has already been covered, so I will not be going into that in detail. What I want to emphasize is that it, it is preferred to identify and designate an isolated delivery room for mothers who are suspected or proven COVID-19. This always helps. And this is what we are doing at our facility also. We have a separate uh, identified area where we are uh, catering to COVID suspect or COVID positive mothers along with the babies. This helps us in uh, maintaining uh, a spread of infection. Now, uh, whenever we are uh, going for a, to receive a delivery, it is very important that the prior uh, COVID status, uh, if they suspect that there is a suspect COVID status, then that should be informed to the uh, team or to the uh, people who are going to receive the baby. Uh, the use of full PPE too in case of suspect or positive COVID patients is what we are following. The resuscitation warmer in the, these delivery areas are at least two meters apart. And uh, we ensure that minimum number of people are attending, which are absolutely necessary for the uh, resuscitation of the baby. The neonatal team, which is attending deliveries, all deliveries where there is a suspect or a proven COVID-19, uses PPE2 in our hospital. Adequate, adequate notice we do get before time beforehand so that our team gets time to don the PPE2. Generally, it's a one person where we don't expect an extensive resuscitation. If there an ex extensive resuscitation is expected, then two people go and attend. The donning and doffing area must be well-defined. This is very, very important with adequate space, convenient sitting place and disposable bins as per the guidelines, which should be followed because these are the areas where the, there are maximum chances of getting infection. Now, to transfer the neonate, again, uh, you can uh, transfer the babies either in an open care warmer or a resuscitator, 
as I told earlier also, the tra chances of ch baby transmitting infection is very, very low. In fact, extremely rare because these, these babies are not infected. And even that's why the open business tail is also safe to be used. And at least one member of the team, while they are being transferred, should doff off and should clear the area and uh, act as a sort of a runner to uh, alert the place where the, the baby is being located. This we are trying to follow and we are doing that. For that, it's very, very important that uh, the individual facilities must have a local contextual plan or demonstration of the map for where they are delivering COVID suspect or COVID positive and where they are keeping the newborns in the high risk. Now, these scenarios have been taken from uh, clinical practice guidelines based on evidences from NNF and Foxy. And just to briefly summarize, if you have a scenario where there is a limited space, large number of COVID cases, and there is a evidence of community spread, then the health, a healthy mother and baby diet can be isolated together. Direct breastfeeding is given, can be given, but with adequate hand washing and uh, aerosol and uh, your um, uh, aerosol and hand hygiene being followed strictly. If it is not feasible for the maternal and newer because of maternal unit condition that both can be uh, together, then express breast milk can be given and it is safe. It can be given to the baby and uh, whenever possible, it is better to discharge uh, the newborn early and follow up by a telephonic conversation. Now, in a scenario two, where you have some facilities, there is no community spread and you, have, you can control the uh, process area, uh, then you should go for a separate uh, uh, area for keeping these babe, uh, mothers and babies. Immediate cord clamp is we are following. And uh, it is better that these babies are handed over to the family caregiver who is otherwise healthy. And uh, uh, an early discharge and telephonic follow-up along with uh, early rooming. Now that's very, very important. And we always keep a special emphasis on that. As soon as the mother turns out to be negative, we room them back. And that's why an early rooming is always preferred. Now, uh, breastfeeding in COVID era, is a lot of questions than there would be. So uh, as per the ICMR guidelines and your MOHF guidelines, women can breastfeed. Yes, it is safe, but it's a very important rider. And that is respiratory hygiene and wearing a mask, a triple layer mask, because it has been documented that most of these infections which the newborn acquires is by your accidental contact with your respiratory fomites or your uh, unhygienic uh, hands or your uh, available uh, contaminated surface areas. So wash hands before and after touching the baby, routine cleanly and disinfect surfaces that the mothers have touched. And mother, if the mother is unwell, again, the breastfeed can be sent by uh, EB. Now, uh, some resuscitation salient points. So we, it is preferred that the resuscitation area should be separate adjacent to the place where the mother is delivering. However, uh, we have got a two meter distance from the place where the mother delivers and this is a standard practice and this is perfectly safe. Follow standard neonatal resuscitation protocol guidelines, which you are already following. Positive pressure ventilation, if required, is safe, can be given with self-inflating bag and mask is preferred. Some people use HME filters, but that's not available in our setup. Uh, in spite of that, that's safe, uh, inflating bag and mask is okay. Now, minimum number of personnel should be there. That's very, very important, which is required. Umbilical cord, we are clamping them promptly and avoiding skin-to-skin -skin contact. However, there are some other evidences which are coming, which will be updated later on. The delivery team member, ideally, should be handing over the baby to the doctors receiving the uh, newborn. But in our setup, uh, the process is not that strictly controlled. However, uh, we are using PPE2 for all suspect or positive COVID patients. Now, uh, for just a word about respiratory support in newborns, as uh, told by Dr. Amit, we, uh, and that's literally uh, quite a consolation for us. Uh, not sick babies are, not many newborn babies are COVID positive, neither the suspicion. However, NIPPV or high flow nasal cannulas can be avoided in such cases, and a healthcare should practice contact and droplet isolation using N95 mask. Antivirals have not been recommended right now. I will just skip that fast. And uh, in suspected or confirmed neonatal COVID-19 infections, we are yet to see a baby. We are not uh, uh, in that uh, group. Uh, they should be managed in separate isolations as per the recommended guidelines. And uh, if not feasible with suspected or confirmed infection, a single isolation facility can be used, but then there should be uh, a decent space between the two cohorts of at least six, uh, your two meters. 
Now, uh, neonatal isolation area, which you have an, uh, identified for COVID suspect or COVID positive newborns, should have preferably a negative airborne isolation rooms are preferred. Again, these are difficult um, uh, logistics, but the easy one is out. You have two to four exhaust fans, which can drive out the air with the proper ventilation, which we have luckily in our area. Isolation room should have adequate ventilation. And if there is a room uh, air condition, it should be preferably a, a, not a uh, central air condition. It should be a window air air condition and there should be 12 air exchanges uh, uh, every hour that's the standard recommendation of course central AC air conditioning is not recommended now which new ones to be tested as i told you we do not have an experience with that however the recommendation as per the clinical practice guidelines is that if the mother is covid 19 within 14 to 28 days of perinatal period that means 14 days prior to conception or uh, 28 days uh, after delivery or and or the baby is symptomatic then the newborn may be tested. Now, neonatal isolation areas are, again, the doctors and the supporting staff should be separate. Again, a huge challenge, a challenge administratively. They should be provided with adequate supplies of PPE, and they should know how to use and safely dispose these PPE. But these are some of the learnings which I've tried to just briefly tell what we are trying to do, and we have some success. It's a huge challenge, moral motivation, keeping your team safe, and keeping the patient safe. So what we have realized that if you do an efficient triaging, very, very important, that the time, of the orange areas, which uh, uh, was mentioned earlier, and a housekeeping and repeated training. Training is very, very important. Again, training doesn't mean uh, an official training. It should be comprehensible to the each level category of the medical staff. It could be a housekeeping staff. It could be a sweeper. It could be even the guards, which are requiring frequent handholding and understandable uh, 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 concepts. Now, this really helps the process mapping. So if you're able to control the process or to some extent own up the process by the frontline health worker, you have a robust infection control practice. We are trying very hard for this. And uh, this is bearing some results in terms of that our uh, team morale, especially in the new NHL team morale, is relatively stable as I compare to the other team morales of other teams. So this really helps. Uh, some of the lessons which we have learned so far is that PPE use is very, very important. I think many of our friends don't exactly know how to um, ensure that seal of N95 mask is adequate and it is not uh, inadequate. Very, very important, correct use. Avoiding fatigue, 12 hour shifts are fine. 24, four hours, avoid. Don't rotate too much your staff. SOPs for emergency intubation and resuscitation, very, very important. It should be very, very, very defined when to intubate. Go for an elective intubation, early intubation, and do air, aerosol and drop rate protection, extremely important using N95 and your screens. Now, cohorting of staff and avoiding rotation, very, very important. In fact, we are, it's a huge challenge with us. We are trying to tell them because the health workers, are, it's a huge challenge for the health workers to daily uh, change their process learning uh, or, or process flow. If they are posted in a particular area, they get adapted, they are monitoring that process, they are conscious about the fact and they are able to take all necessary precautions. Every two weeks or three weeks rotation puts a huge challenge on them and there could be a memory fatigue, there could be errors. Self-quarantine, we do follow surveillance testing and speech and mask. Yeah, you can't have those extensive rounds with your mask on. Uh, we are innovating. Uh, we'll be sharing that in a subsequent talk. Now, keeping the patient volume low, very, very important. Use telemedicine, use off-site connection, economizing the use of PPE. Again, it's rational, it, has, it should be used. Periodic review and use of checklists to prevent error. So we keep on uh, evaluating ourselves every week. We have a, a short discussion, um, preferably an offsite on WhatsApp as to what where, what can be improved. And we do have some mock drills because uh, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, many things crop up new and we get to learn a lot. Recognize, recognizing uh, work-related stress is very, very important. And caring for patients as well as your team members, very, very important. As, as a team leader or as a, a person you are working, you must be concerned about your team safety. I, I will say again and again, that only is a big morale booster and confidence uh, maker and, and makes people, everybody safe. Last but not the least slide, in fact, it is the most important slide. The biggest challenge we are facing right now is the psychological safety of the healthcare workers. And, and, and that's a paradigm shift. And what I feel and what we have some experience, very small, although very, very small experience, is that knowledge, process ownership, good infection control practices, improved patient and health work safety pushes up the confidence level. 
and that brings down that psychological uh, fear or panic or anxiety and this is very very important i will again repeat it ignorance fear increase process variability with ignorance and fear there comes huge process variability and that puts up a huge pressure on infection control patients and health teams are all at risk and they have a vicious uh, cycle and then our work becomes extremely uh, difficult thank you again and uh, if any questions we will be taking that thanks vikram thanks for the opportunity thank you sushil i think uh, that was very practical especially i loved your last slide it was wonderful uh, and the psychological safety aspects are mostly neglected in most of uh, the challenging scenarios epidemics uh, natural calamities disaster like situations i'm very happy that you brought it to the notice of our participants here so with this very quickly we are moving to a short 12 minute presentation by dr ankur sudan dr ankur like i told you is a who consultant he is mainly in charge of not only the quality improvement process in india but he is mainly looking after the quality improvement in who cro region of nepal and uh, mainly he is looking after the bangladesh quality improvement program with who uh, cro so we are very proud to uh, have dr ankur and uh, we feel honored uh, ankur the screen is all yours Thank you, Vikram. Uh, could you just confirm if my slide is visible and my voice yeah, is audible? Yeah, that's absolutely fine, Uncle. Um, Uncle thank you. Well. Okay, so uh, good evening. It's been a, uh, a long uh, series of uh, presentations. Uh, this being the last one, I'll try my best to keep your interest and uh, trying to tell you uh, something the other uh, presenters have not yet. So uh, yeah, I'm a um, I'm a quality improvement advisor. I primarily advise health systems and hospitals and clinicians. Uh, on how to improve the quality of care that they provide my area mainly concerns with maternal and newborn health so uh, i've put together a few slides uh, where i'll try to help you understand how quality improvement thinking uh, you know can be applied while we deal with this uh, once in a century pandemic so uh, so um, what is quality improvement thinking uh many of the uh, viewers i believe i uh, have are uh, have been doing quality improvement uh, been working with ngocn and partner uh, organizations uh, and some probably are not so uh, quickly quality improvement thinking is is a broader area it's a it's a applied science which is used to improve the quality of healthcare right and there are many uh, uh, there are many concepts within quality improvement thinking i am going to focus on the ones that you see on your screen and i'll uh, go with them one by one so uh, an important quality improvement concept is to prioritize you know we always will have many problems to deal with even in normal circumstances uh, healthcare facilities healthcare systems have to deal with multiple priorities uh, and we always have to prioritize what we must do so how do we prioritize you know you, we have hospitals shut down or hospitals trying to continue services we'll have to prioritize which services do we want to continue providing we have to prioritize which clients uh, need these services uh, you know on an urgent basis and uh, which clients probably can be dealt with telemedicine or can be delayed we have to look at what outcomes are we going to prevent and uh, very clearly you know our focus is going to be around there uh we also have to look at what is feasible and you know what is within our control while we we may want want to be the best covid hospital or we may want to be a facility which continues to provide neonatal health services and maternal health services while uh, not having a single case of uh, you know uh, spread within the hospital but we have to clearly look at what is within our control and focus on that i couldn't emphasize more about working in teams uh, working alone we we will never be able to uh, you know solve any problem in healthcare certainly not in when a pandemic is, uh, is you know uh, onto us uh, and working in teams the most important thing in healthcare uh, facilities and healthcare teams is that we have to empower the frontline staff don't tell them what they must do ask what problems they face when they try to do it and solve those problems people who are involved in the processes of care know much more about how care happens on the ground than anybody who's probably drafting a policy so uh, it, unless you involve these process owners into decision making uh, your decisions are never going to be implemented even the best of guidelines will fall flat in the face of reality so involve process owners as much as possible 
leaders need to be inclusive they need to keep their ears open to uh, you know people who are on ground and uh, also you know um, anybody who's leading a team needs to model the right behavior if i as a head of a unit do not wash my hands while entering that unit i should not expect any of my staff to do so so you can't just tell people to do good behaviors we have to be uh, you know exemplifying that um, even in these tough times it's important to continue to use data um, you know one key principle in quality improvement is you know objective decision making or data based decision making so you have to continue to use data um, you could use data to list out the missing clients number of women who were supposed to deliver this month and um, you know are nowhere to be seen we may want to reach out to them babies who were who had a tough battle uh, you know in our newborn units and finally were healthy and went back but there have not been follow ups uh, you could look at infection prevention uh, processes how many people walked in, into this gate and how many washed their hands um, how many staff need uh, respiratory protection of a pp3 level and out of them how many are able to do that so uh, if you continue to measure your infection prevention processes uh, you know you will certainly uh, reduce your outcomes Uh, bring in an agile data collection we are not trying to do a research study here right so uh, be very agile about your data collection have quick checklists that can quickly tell you about the preparedness in your facilities uh, use peer to peer observation uh, donning and doffing in particular you know no matter how how many times you have done it you are still likely to make a mistake so having somebody else uh, having a peer look at you and give you a quick feedback which you can you know uh, which can help you uh, don and doff better uh, is is useful and uh, you know quality improvement requires prioritizing it requires you know looking at problems analyzing them but uh, nothing improves if uh, nothing changes so you will have to change a few things so uh, focus on changing the processes and workplace management do not order people to change you know i can order my staff that do not get infected by covid that doesn't help anybody make it easy for them you know to uh, prevent infections make it easy Uh, for them make make sure that your processes are arranged in a way your workplace is arranged in a way which makes it easy if i walk into a unit and there is a um, sanitizer lying there i am quite likely to you know sanitize my hands uh, if the workplace is arranged in a way that you know between where i am and where i am supposed to go there is uh, no sanitizer or hand washing facility available i'm quite likely not to wash my hands so look at your workplace uh, you know arrangements and look at how your processes are defined so that uh, you know you can improve those processes to become an enabler for uh, healthcare providers observe these work workflows realign them uh, look at them whether they're working then again observe these workflows again realign them keep doing this you know this will bring in uh, a lot of um, you know, incremental improvements change proactively you know uh, in the face of a, a situation like this i mean certainly uh, the you know the changes will come if there is a positive case or if there is a spread in my hospital please do not wait to react to a difficult situation preempt that difficult situation and change proactively most important listen to the client even in this difficult times you know uh, the client has some rights more than the rights you know they know something about their illness their condition about you know um, uh, the processes of care that we as providers will never know involve them in decisions that impact their lives right and uh, very important do not forget the human inside the patient you know this is a patient you know they might be or maybe they are covid positive but they continue to remain a human so this is a small example i picked from somewhere it's it seems pretty common in in new york uh, to uh, do a face time you know with the family of a covid positive person especially before you know palliative care starts you know you know their last time starts so do a face time with the family uh, so that it allows a closer closure to the family and also you know To, to those who are conscious you know they can see their family so uh, while this is routine you know uh, uh, this this particular doctor who treated this uh, said that you know he thought maybe we will just clean the face and do the face time but there was a nurse there who took some time to wash and comb the hair so that this person you know who was going to be uh, extubated uh, you know soon and would not have survived for long uh, you know it looks nice uh, to the family probably they are they, you know they are their last few moments on earth Uh, in their lives uh, maybe you know they would have wanted to look good so continue to you know be humane in the care you provide uh, iterate your changes you know uh, whenever you try to change a system or change a process you might not be perfect in the first go it takes a couple of iterations uh, to get to where you want right 
so uh, you know we, there's variety of guidelines and you're getting new guidelines uh, and and that that's a problem with healthcare healthcare systems healthcare facilities are complex systems you know and they're very adaptive in nature so guidelines cannot be applied as is you know guidelines might have you know a nice diagram saying that you know this person wears pp1 this person wears pp2 and then another one a pp3 or something else guidelines are are guidelines you know they are universal guidelines they're meant for everybody that means that they are not specifically made for your unit your hospital you know standards are universal universal but you have to find your own purpose uh, before you know uh, following a guideline and saying that okay this but this particular staff uh, is recommended to be wearing pp2 or is recommended to be wearing a respirator or a three ply mask find your purpose why are you doing this why is a staff who does uh, procedures where aerosol generation happens you know is required to wear a certain things unless your team you yourself find that purpose why you are doing that you quite likely not do, not to do it you can as human beings we cannot follow something just because it has been told to us so take time to help your peers your friends take time uh, for yourself to understand why you are donning a, a, a certain equipment in the pp what is the importance of doing that that will take away the fear right because if i don't understand why i'm doing it i might want to be covered in an overall and have a you know mechanized respirator which cleans all the air that comes to us that doesn't help much so uh, find out your purpose why you are doing certain actions and you know contextualization is very important you know so guidelines and standards will be universal use the eyes and ears at the front line you know you people who are on the ground who carry out day to day processes um, you know doctors nurses residents your security guards who probably deal with the uh, with the client you know foremost they uh, they understand something about these processes how these standards or guidelines can be implemented in your unit so you know they will help you contextualize that to your requirements and uh, you know the best might seem difficult but with this continuous cycle of uh, you know redesigning your processes of care and your arrangement of workplace every day you can keep getting a notch better and you know the uh, quality uh, always uh, you know we say is a continuous task even now it is a continuous task so keep trying to get better at infection prevention or covid management or routine management while covid is there with all of the changes that you want to do try them out first don't wait for a covid positive patient to arrive to your hospital to to try out how we should be doing you know management of a covid positive patient simulate these scenarios do mock drills continue to do mock drills till the time it's a muscle memory for you uh, and also uh, you know another reason why you should try out things is that you know implementation sometimes we you know quite often the implementation is resisted resisted if i want that to from tomorrow everybody will do this you know somebody or others might resist it you know it's human nature to let status quo continue and you know not adapt to newer ways of things but you can always ask your team to try out so i'll show a small example uh, uh, around uh, one and a half months ago i looked at this uh, you know um, this um, outdoor screening before the opd from mgms varda where they had put a table fan behind the doctor who sort of you know uh, sits in a special opd looking at flu like illnesses so i i understood the point of putting a table fan behind the provider because you know it will it will shoo the droplets away so it's adds an additional layer of protection and i would recommend you you could also do it so this was my inspiration and i had attended a webinar where uh, you know another expert said this so i wanted to do it so i run a small uh, clinic not in routine but uh, in these difficult times i'm having to run a clinic so i also tried to put a fan um, uh, where i you know behind where the provider would sit and uh, but i faced resistance so this was early march i am in himachal pradesh it was quite cold in the mornings we were allowed to open a clinics only 3 hours that's like 7 to um, 7 to 10 or something so it was quite cold in the morning and uh, my uh, my assistant in the clinic he said that uh, uh, you know doctor it's very cold you know in front of the fan it's very cold i can't sit like this so i had to explain to him the purpose of why we are doing it so i picked up the glass cleaner and i sprayed it towards the fan from a point where typically my patient would stand and told him to try it out uh, as well so when he tried it out he could see all droplets coming back to his face and i made him sit on the provider's chair and he could figure out that no droplets reached there so you know that was a small trying out which helped him understand the importance of doing this so uh, you know this is a clear example of pdsa or trying out cycles as we call them plan do study and act you know uh, uh, you do them to learn how things are happening you don't have to wait for a positive patient to come and then you know 
uh, suffer from a droplet infection to find out that uh, you know putting a fan behind you is a great thing so uh, um, you know lastly please collaborate you know alone we will never be able to solve this uh, be good uh, you know to your staff be kind to them but you know also be considerate to all the people you uh, talk to you know everybody is in a difficult time the mankind is in a time that they have not they are in such a pandemic that that had not been here for uh, last century or so uh, but you know being considerate uh, considerate to other human beings and other providers and our own team members will help us it's important to learn from each other we are doing a webinar where you know dr amit just presented uh, his experiences from uh, from oxford in uk and then we have uh, we have had experiences being shared from maharashtra from delhi from himachal so you know continue to learn from each other we don't have to you know reinvent the wheel uh, on our own in every unit and uh, please ask whenever you are in doubt ask continue to ask you know no the, uh, the person might not have an answer but you will never know unless you ask and find your allies you are not alone you are running a you know small clinic sitting somewhere in a remote village there are others you know we are we are, we are well connected uh, um, you know mankind right now uh, and you know reach out to your to your allies you know they can help you out so and then you know this is unique about human beings we can collaborate we can do a zoom call the coronavirus can't do it you know the coronavirus is sitting in uh, somewhere in the corner in wuhan and somewhere in oxford and in india cannot talk to each other we human beings can this is an edge we have over uh, you know this species has an edge over every other species that we can collaborate in you know groups of millions across oceans across continents please use that edge you know to defeat this virus so uh, you know uh, this is my last slide uh, basically what i'm trying to tell you here is about human resilience and health system resilience any pandemic any catastrophe any you know difficulty as big as this will require us to be resilient right so uh, you know two kinds of resilience is required here one is human resilience primarily of the healthcare uh, provider here i uh, want to say and second you know we need health systems which are resilient so human resilience is intuitive it's it's natural god made us this way we we have a you know our resilience is an intuitive response to extreme adversity um, uh, and um, you know when we when we are faced with problems that we haven't ever faced in our life we come up with bravery that we haven't shown in our life but then this human resilience or this healthcare provider's resilience does not exist in a vacuum uh, you know it depends on an enabling environment i might be capable of doing quite a bit uh, but it really depends on whether i have an enabling environment or not so let's look at health system resi resilience no health system resilience is not natural primarily because you know it's it's not uh, god who created uh, health system uh, health systems it's human beings who did it right and they are not as perfect as human beings are as a species so uh, health system resilience will depend upon the design you know how the processes and systems are designed how the different parts of health systems or healthcare facilities are designed and it will also depend on current needs my my healthcare facility might have been you know really strong to uh, fight with the, uh, with an older spread of disease but maybe you know my design of processes and systems in my facility is not you know not perfect for the current needs in covid pandemic so you know health system uh, designs and health system resilience you know it will need continuous iteration you'll have to continue to make it better you can't ever have a perfect one but you can continue to make it better but once you do it you allow for the individual the human being on you know the first part of the slide to become resilient right so you know we human beings are quite brave we can fight the coronavirus pandemic uh, but we do require our systems to become equally resilient and those systems will be made one step at a time so you know please take the step you can please do what you can to make the health facility your unit your room your own processes of care uh, resilient to this pandemic so i leave you with this thought thank you thank you so much uh, dr ankur uh, for that lucid presentation specific specifically i really liked your try prepare uh, uh, part because we need to be prepared most of the teams are getting caught unawares you know even though we are aware that the pandemic has been going on for quite some time now the teams are not prepared so very quickly before we will we would be ending the live stream soon harish uh, yes i am ready in next 5 6 minutes we are taking very quick questions we are very thankful to the host of questions which have come uh, we will try and answer each of them but most of the people are known to us and their names are there and uh, uh, it's all yours harish
Yeah, Dr. Mathur, sir, are you there? Yeah, I'm unmuting Professor Mathur, sir. Yeah, you can go ahead, Harish. Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, again, taking the clue from the last slide shown by Ankur about uh, health system resilience and health worker resilience. So uh, doing those things, you must have found several challenges, like for healthcare worker uh, optimization, during uh, putting them on shifts, putting them on rest, and then quarantine. All those must have been very challenging to you. So maybe you can share some of your uh, planning, some of your uh, plans which you implemented in Lady Hardy Medical College. And the related question is, again, uh, what about the health system resilience being making that COVID building strong enough that it didn't spread infection to outside the COVID building? So what systems and how did you make it possible there so on these two options, on these two issues, you may kindly comment on that. So, um, I missed your question. Uh, I didn't hear your question completely, but um, you, you mean to say that how we prevent the infection getting out from the COVID is, building? Yeah, this is one side and another is how did we utilize in the best possible way the large number of healthcare workers which we are having and how did we did optimization of their services? Means uh, right. some workers are coming, some are in rest. So, and so, some are so, 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 the, so the healthcare workers have been divided into um, uh, uh, into a duty which is either the COVID related or not COVID related. Now the COVID related duties are intensive duties which are there for 14 days, and then the person is off for 14 days. And this gets repeated or it gets, you know, cycled. So most of the cases it gets cycled that uh, 14 days duty and uh, then 14 days off. Then another group comes 14 days duty, another off. And maybe the off fellow goes after that 14 days off, he goes into non-COVID duty and another group comes. And uh, we had not been following this from for the interns till now, but from today, we are following this for the interns also. So uh, uh, it will be uh, one third of the group of the interns which will be posted and two third will be resting home or in the in the hostel. Um, it has become very necessary. This has this we have learned hard way uh, uh, and uh, it has become very necessary. And if some facility has to continue for a long time um, uh, and continue to to provide service for a long time, then there is no way out but to keep your uh, most of the workforce not exposed, which is becoming difficult day by day because uh, healthcare workers, unfortunately, are not getting exposed now in the hospital. The healthcare workers sometimes are bringing the infection from their home. And that is another challenge, you know, that uh, you may put them off, but still, they may get infected and they get infected at home or their hostel or at some other place. So it's it's a very complicated thing now. Uh, but still, uh, it is better to have intensive work for 14 days on rotation than off and then again. As far as uh, measures taken for the, uh, for the infection not to go out from the healthcare facility, uh, the measures are the same that donning and doffing properly done at the proper place and very correctly done. So, and, uh, but we faced some issues. We faced in the initial part and even now, uh, the COVID had not been that much of a medical problem, fortunately in India. Uh, the patients going in the ICUs and in the, on the ventilators had been minimal. The COVID is more of a law and order problem for us. Or maybe what you can say, uh, how to uh, discipline or treat it epidemiologically. How to create groups that the one group doesn't infect the others. So it is more of that that we are engaged in, rather than actually uh, uh, the clinical medicine or the uh, the clinical uh, critical care. Uh, fortunately, uh, till now in India. Uh, had not been the challenge which we were dreading earlier when we went into this phase of pandemic. 
So that is a good thing which has happened. The, the time will tell and the research will tell why it has happened and why, why, why uh, the things are quite different from what it is there in Spain or Belgium or um, uh, other countries. But, uh, uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, Italy. But uh, the things had been dramatically different. So thank you. That's my view. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now questions, several questions are for the Amit. Mm -hmm. Amit, many people are really concerned about use of PPE. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Surekha Tayade from Barda has asked that healthcare workers are using PPE even then they are getting infected. So what may be the reasons for that, that they are getting infected and even dying? So what may be the reasons for that? So uh, it's a very important question. And I think uh, that, is, um, that is bothering all healthcare workers. So data from the UK tells us that um, those people who work in the highly infectious areas, such as the intensive care, the operation theaters, and anesthetists, their rate of infection is actually quite low. So people are picking up the infection from those areas where you consider it to be slightly low risk. Right? Now here becomes an issue. Is it that people have got improper PPE, which is one theory, or whether the behavior of such people in those low risk areas is, um, is not taking the entire risk into account? Now we know um, that, uh, for example, in the early part of the pandemic, uh, the focus was in the high intensity areas. And what happened is, the ones which were not considered uh, high risk either didn't get much PPE or got PPE, which was inadequate. But now we have reached a mature form of the pandemic and we realize that, um, for example, in our building, the building I'm sitting, this is there's a 20% positivity rate um, across the corridor. But just by making sure that we have apron, gloves, and a simple surgical mask, but good hand washing before we put it, maintaining social distance, that is enough for us to cut the infection rate. So we are not seeing staff sickness in this unit, which is more than what it was before the COVID pandemic. And, and that's, that is simply uh, reiterating the point that it is PPE, yes, but the right use of PPE and making sure that you maintain good hygiene standards is, is actually far more important. So I think that is, that is the answer that I, I would suggest. Uh, we had a staff sickness rate of about 4% before COVID. And after COVID, even though it's reached the peak and gone, it has gone up to 5%. So uh, this, this suggests that you know, good simple measures actually work quite well. Uh, there are several questions about reuse of N95 masks. Mm -hmm. How can we reuse? How many times we can use? Can we reuse same mask several times in a day? Mm -hmm. Or four masks per month, three masks for three weeks or two weeks? Several issues are there. Can you explain about it? So, I mean, reusing of the mask is not, not something which is uh, advocated at all. So you use it for the shift and you wear it and you don't reuse it. That is the standard guideline. Um, <laughs> But the masks are expensive. I do understand that. But the, the question is, more importantly for newborn care and obstetric service, is when do you want to use it? So we've got a whole box full of N95 masks, which we have not used, because we use simple masks, simple surgical masks with apron and gloves for most of the procedures, excepting when you're attending a GA section where you have to put the mask on. So we have done all the training, but we have hardly used N95. And I'm talking specifically for the neonatal and obstetric settings. So as I said in my presentation, all our midwives, all of them are in only PPE1, which is masks, simple surgical mask, uh, apron and gloves, even though the mother is COVID positive. And I think, and that is, that is, even though she's positive. So 
For example, last week, um, four days ago, we had a delivery. Father was positive, mother was positive. We went and attended the delivery in simple care. Uh, and that's, that's, that's what we are following. So these issues get mixed up, but our anxiety levels and our use of PPE has become less aggressive as time has passed. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Amit, the, the way you explained, this will be quite reassuring for many of us that using simple three-layer mask, three mask is also very, very effective. There are some questions about the breastfeeding policy you have for COVID positive mothers and uh, your testing policy for the newborn babies, whom do you test for a swab for COVID positivity? So <clears throat> if there is a babe, if there is a mother who is COVID positive, clinical or, or proven, we test the baby on day three. So we, we try and put the baby in a different area because on day zero, the test results are usually negative. So by day three, we test the baby and we are also recommending a test at day five. But if you have to choose one test, we stick with day five, if you've got one test to do. So if you don't have many tests, you just do day five. And that point you declare the baby is negative. Now, if the mother is uh, positive and the baby is with the mother, then the breastfeeding goes on fine, right? If the mother is, if the baby is, uh, if the baby is on the neonatal unit, what we try and do is avoid a positive mother come to the neonatal unit because we want to prevent cross contamination. So it's not a risk to the baby, but it is simply the risk to the rest of the staff. Okay, breastfeeding continues as normal. For all normal babies, there is normal care, irrespective of COVID status. You've got to wear a mask, have good hand hygiene, and you breastfeed. You keep the baby with the mother only or separately? If the, the baby... The, if, the ba if, uh, if, the, um, if the mother is positive, and yeah, baby stays with mother. If the baby does not need intensive care, baby stays with mother, goes home with mother. Okay, so without, without even confirming whether mother has come negative or not, Mother is still positive. You are keeping baby with the mother Absolutely. and mother is using some kind of mask and other things. Yeah, yeah. That's that's all we can do. So we, we, we don't, if the mother is positive, we do not separate the baby from the mother at all. If the baby does not need to be with us, stays with mother. What we try and do okay. is very we have an question. early... Sorry. So we have an early discharge policy. We don't want a positive mother to hang around in the hospital for long. What we try and do is get her home early. So discharge jaldi karte hain, uh, but okay. with the baby. Yeah. Okay. And also, very, we, we do not right, have very separate... small question. Yeah, go on. of the. Uh, go on, sir. Uh, if a baby gets uh, respiratory distress, mm -hmm. do you test every baby irrespective of the mother was positive or mother was negative? No. We only started testing babies which had an unusual course. Now, it wasn't fitting into standard RDS or you've suddenly discovered that a preterm baby was fine, was developing fevers. So we started testing them, knowing very well the vast majority of them will be negative. But that was done simply in part because we wanted to allay staff anxiety and see what, what the spread is. Yeah, and we we had uh, I think close to seventy two tests which were done, and most of them were negative. So our anxiety to test, our eagerness to test has fallen throughout the region. Simply because we have not found many positives, in a clinical case which deteriorates, the only ones which have we have found positive are where the mother is positive, the baby was with mother and the baby was then admitted to the neonatal unit. So he's got it from the mother and we know that the mother is positive. We haven't had surprise positive tests from, from a negative mother. So we used to, we were sending a lot of tests on the neonatal unit in the early part. We have stopped doing a lot of tests uh, simply because the vast majority are negative. When the test is being sent, we do not move the baby into any other quarantine. We keep the baby where it is. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you, Amit, for uh, explaining so many things and probably the people who are listening to you mm -hmm. and maybe we, they also will change their practices. Uh, next question is to Dr. Anupa. Lots of questions have come about screening and testing the mothers whenever they are coming for ANC or in labor. So first you please explain the difference between screening and testing. People are using it synonymously. So what to screen, when to screen, and when to test the mother, these are the main questions for you. So uh, I would begin by saying that uh, in this time, one thing which we have to have at the back of our hand are the proper triaging protocols. We have to know that who is a case, who is a suspect, and when we use our triaging protocol, then the flowchart absolutely falls in place. Then we are very clear about uh, whom to screen or whom to test, for example. So there is something which is known as a COVID suspect, and there is something which is known as a COVID positive patient coming to us. And why these questions actually are coming up is because of a new guideline which has come from ICMR regarding hotspots whether we would uh, want to uh, test patients coming from hotspots. So those are the patients who fall in the category of screening. And testing are the patients who come as suspects, who, have, who go under the definition of a COVID suspect. So those are symptomatic patients or uh, who have had a definite amount of contact with a patient who is symptomatic for a definite period of time. So those are the patients we test. And screening so, is on, only in patients who are coming from these uh, specific areas where community spread is high as a strategy to curtail the infection in the uh, larger good. So, so any, any woman who is coming in labor, we shall ask those questions and exactly. confirm the status. Exactly. So if she qualifies for testing, then we test and work accordingly. Is it exactly. the policy? And, yes. And one thing which I would want to uh, again highlight at this point in time is that we need to have our triaging protocols at the back of our hand, one, and we should not be caught by surprise. Yes. So if we need to uh, uh, retake our history and uh, do probing, I think it is uh, very important uh, in the times of pandemic, and it is also our uh, moral duty to be saving uh, the healthcare providers. So no error on that side. See, see what happens, uh, Dr. Mathur is there, Whenever we enter in our hospital, there is one security person who checks temperature. Yes. Okay. So if any woman coming for labor, for delivery or for antenatal, if she has a fever, then what would you do? So what we have to do is that we have to have a reception and a triage area in times like this. Every, uh, every hospital needs to have uh, all of that. And we have uh, proper training of the staff, uh, which will uh, look into uh, uh, a set of questions which follow after the uh, after the temperature has been recorded or there is a history of uh, fever, whether there are any flu-like symptoms, where there is cough, there is any COVID-positive patient in the family. And again, as I said, the triaging protocol automatically gives us the answer whether the patient needs to go into a COVID facility or in a normal facility from that triage area. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anupa. There is one question for Dr. Bengal also. Dr. Bengal, are you listening to me? Yeah, the question is, that some patient has come for delivery and then later on all attended, it was a normal delivery on a screening also, there was no contact and nothing was there. But later on, you find that patient became came positive, developed some symptom, tested and came positive. So at the time of delivery, it was not there. And later on, we found that patient has become positive. Okay. So what to do then about the testing of other staff, quarantine, what we have to do for the other healthcare workers and for this patient? Uh, once we suspect that this patient has a possibility of a infection, we label her as suspect COVID. As soon as we suspect her as COVID, she is to be shifted to isolation ward. There she will be tested for COVID test Till that time, she will, till the reports of this COVID test come, she remains in the isolation ward. Now we have in retrospect, try to find out who all came in contact with her. All those people are quarantined and tested for COVID. They do not come back to the routine working place till the test results, we receive the test results. So patient is also quarantined. 
uh, is uh, kept in the isolation ward, whereas all the healthcare workers whosoever has come in contact with her are quarantined separately till and everyone is tested and accordingly subsequently we will take the action whether it's positive or negative. Dr. Pemde, if you like, I can add. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, the, so there are um, MOHF guidelines to do the risk categorization of the contacts. There's a high risk contact categorization, medium risk and low risk. So if the person is not following universal precautions and attending such a patient who turns out to be COVID positive later on, right? Then the degree of contact. So if the patient was a, uh, if the doctor was a caregiver or the professional was a caregiver, he comes under high risk contact. If however, they were following universal precautions again, which Dr. Amit rightly pointed out. So uh, uh, in other way, it's not to scare, but you have to follow universal precautions uh, uh, extremely uh, diligently. Now with universal precautions, until unless you are doing an aerosol generating procedure, you are intubating or you are in that group, then your exposure risk becomes very high. Otherwise with uh, your uh, universal precautions and you are not a direct care provider, then your risk category goes a little down. So uh, uh, the risk categorization, I, I will request all the audience to please refer to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare guidelines for risk categorization. It is convenient. We can use it for uh, categorizing our health professionals and, uh, and allaying their anxiety and, and stress. However, having said all, I think we all agree, and as Amit rightly pointed out, sticking to universal precautions, even with good mask, hand hygiene, is uh, the short, short way of uh, at least avoiding accidental exposure because sometimes patient may not be able knowing that he is a COVID positive or uh, sometimes the information may not be forthcoming. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, you I think ask... Vikram, you can take over and ask some questions. Yeah. Can I just add one more thing to what yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, right. said? Is that, you know, as, as we are now in the phase, you know, in Delhi, Ahmedabad, in Mumbai, and uh, Indore, in these places, what is in the hotspots, what you may be finding is that, of course, you are trying to isolate cases and you're trying to quarantine, but more and more you will find that there will be a lot of asymptomatic cases which have not been known. Now, the problem is if you are in that phase of the pandemic where you can safely assume, especially for your staff, that you are, you've got some spread which is largely asymptomatic and you then deal with mothers who come into labor and then you are uh, using a very high low risk approach. The problem is you'll always have a situation where somebody will be testing positive later. And that creates a lot of retrospective fear. You know, uh, was I at the delivery? Who was there? Who was not there? Chalo uska naam nikalo. You know that, and then let's do the quarantine. So here what we are trying to do is if the mother is positive, and if she's safe and she's well, she does not require medical care. Of course, she's in isolation when she's positive, but as soon as possible, we try to send her home. And with clear guidelines, you stay at home, you self-quarantine yourself, do not expose yourself outside. That is number one. For the staff, because everybody's wearing these universal uh, you know, um, uh, protection, what then happens, anxiety levels reduce. And also the infection rate is low. So yes, you, you, you should test them, but uh, the chances of you finding them positive is low. So I think the biggest risk is assuming that you can actually pick up COVID positive through a triad system, because a triad system will fail to pick the large number of asymptomatic carriers, especially in India where the population is young and, these, and people are not falling ill. So they will be walking in the street. They don't know whether it's COVID positive. They may be COVID positive and you may pick that up later. So that's, that's I think, uh, is important. And so I would, I would say what Sushil is saying is, is absolutely important is I think you must assume that anybody walking into your doors may be positive. So that, that should be the fair assumption. Yeah, I think, and that helps our teams also. They get confident. Yeah, that gives a lot of point. And I must tell you that we have moved to this position, you know, not that we started with this position. We started with this uh, fever, cough, oh, then we should get the, but then we said, forget that, let us do simple precautions, not PPE2 for all staff, but simple mask 
and make sure that you've got universal hygiene that is far better and easier and then the staff are not worried if the mother is positive also a known mother is positive you know they, they because they are wearing usual universal precautions so i think okay, that would so, be my uh, point. amit uh, i i'm sorry i'll just have to take two more questions last questions and then yeah. end because it's I know there's yeah. too many questions in the chat box. If we continue addressing them, it will be more than 24 yeah. hours. I'm yeah, thankful okay. to all the participants for uh, raising so much interest. We'll try and see, pose it to the experts, do a write-up. My office is going to do it. And then put it yes. as a mail across in the forums uh, with the answers. So that is what we can promise. So a quick question to you, Amit. Uh, one uh, question is, what about the immunization uh, services? Harish is in charge of immunization services in Galavati Saran Hospital. What happens to these guys, uh, the newborns who are like ex uh, born to COVID positive mothers turn positive and the guys who are born to COVID positive mothers but remain negative? What is your guideline for immunization? So we have not changed any of our guidelines for immunization. So they remain the same, uh, irrespective of COVID status, partly on the fact that even babies who are COVID positive have shown a very mild or nil illness. So we don't think they are at increased risk. So we haven't changed any guidelines for immunization is a short answer. So you, you advocate that routine immunization services should be continued and in fact maintained. And and not, fact maintained uh, because stopped. one of the side effects is you cut down the immunization rate and then you have another problem on your hands. Yeah. Yes. So thank you so much, Amit. I think Arish has got the answer. So uh, really, we, we are already are we are, here. We are, Vikram, uh, for your information, we are having our immunization services open. Yes. We are giving all the immunization at birth and all yeah. services are routine and normal. So this was a question from Kapila in Galavati Saran Hospital. I think my nursing colleagues will also got the answer. So uh, thank you so much. One last question to Ankur Sudan. Ankur, there is a question uh, from Dr. Anuradha Pichumani. She is secretary of the CAHO. CAHO is the Confederation of Accredited Hospitals of India. Madam is uh, based in Chennai. And she wants to ask you a question. Uh, this question says that in times, uh, challenging times like uh, COVID, how can you use, uh, you know, morale building uh, techniques using quality improvement? How can you build up the morale, uh, like something to do with the psychology of change, which we were discussing previously? Just a moment, just a moment, Ankur, I'll unmute you. Yeah, just a moment. Yeah, just a moment. Yeah, I, I think it uh, should be audible now. Okay, so uh, I have a two-part answer to this. Number one, fear comes from the fact that, you know, we do not know enough. Knowledge will always help you fight that fear. Know what you must know. That's one. Second, about healthcare providers and, you know, uh, morals going down. Uh, you know, with the last 10 years of experience working on quality improvement and, you know, working on the morale of healthcare providers, uh, <clears throat> Healthcare providers will do something primarily for three reasons. Number one, they should have a purpose. I can don a PPE-3 if I understand what a PPE-3 does. I can don a respirator if I understand what a respirator is. Give me the purpose of doing something. I will do it. Don't just tell me to do what I must do. Second, I need mastery. I have not worn a respirator in my life. Please explain to me how it is done. Once I have mastery over it, you know, you can't take it away from me. I, I can continue to wear a N95 respirator all my life. And third and most important, autonomy. Give me the autonomy to decide things that I must decide, uh, you know, which are important to my life and my client's life. So, you know, give them purpose, give them mastery, give them autonomy, leave them. They have enough resilience within them. Thank you. Thank you, Ankur, for the Vikram, can I just add one small point at the end? Yeah, uh, yeah, Amit. In terms of resilience and so on, uh, we found in our unit uh, one, one thing that has always worked is absolutely clear cut communication. One, one page goes out from my office every week to all my staff. It doesn't have a lot of information, it has updates but it is very clear and you've got to work hard on getting very clear, uh, very clear communication and not have multiple sources. That is, so a small internet and that internet site, which we have de developed, only one source, clear information that allays a lot of anxieties. Because as uh, Dr. Sudhan has just mentioned, it is that information, if it is clear, that 
keeps people calm. I think it's the fear of the unknown that you know re really raises anxiety. And secondly, what we have done is within our unit, we have chosen one senior person to represent one group where doctors or nurses can approach and discuss anxieties. And we have had a lot of uh, people coming to you, just talking about, you know, I've come, people come to my office, they're worried about their auntie who's got lung disease or something like that, you know, and you just have a talk and that one source within each team where people can go, approachable person, that uh, for each group, we've got one for nursing, one for doctors, and that works very well. So those are the two things I would like to say. So thank you so much for addressing that psychological safety issue. I think these were multiple questions coming. I couldn't name everybody. Yeah. So Professor Mathur, sir, uh, we are going to the concluding part now. We'll uh, request uh, uh, Professor Mathur uh, to uh, kindly give the uh, concluding key messages, sir, which you want to give to this larger audience. And thank you so much, sir, for being present right through this. We understand that you've been keeping extremely busy and devoting so much of time in this. We are really grateful to you for your presence, sir. Thank you very much for having me here. And I really learned a lot, though I was co coming in and going out, but I almost heard everything. And uh, it was very enlightening talks by, by everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. So uh, with this, uh, we uh, draw to a close of, uh, of this webinar. And I, my special thanks on behalf of NQCN and, and Professor Mathur is representing Government of India and Lady Harding Medical College. And we have WHO CRO, then we have Piramal Swast, we have uh, Rural Medical College uh, Pravara, and we have uh, Amit from Oxford NHS Trust. Thank you so much, all of you, for sparing so much of time and uh, increasing the awareness of the healthcare workers across India and abroad. We've had questions coming from as far as United States of America as well. And we had Dr. So uh, Ms. Somini, who was a staff nurse in Kalavati Saran Hospital. She's now moved to Florida. Very senior staff nurse. She posted a question on reuse of N95. It was beautifully addressed. Thank you so much. This is the first and uh, second in a series of webinars, uh, sir, which is designed for healthcare providers. Next in line is a webinar which is designed for uh, ethics in times of coronavirus pandemics. And Professor Harish Pemde has very kindly agreed to uh, drive it forward. And very soon we will be uh, intimating about that. Thank you so much for your time and stay safe. All of you, thank you so much once again. Thank you. Good night, everyone.